Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Twill, and I am head of sustainability for the property division of a firm called Lendlease, based in Sydney, Australia. We are a global property and infrastructure firm operating in cities around the world, and we are pioneers of sustainable built environments for the past 50 years. And we are currently responsible for delivering one of the world's largest carbon neutral precincts in Sydney in a project called Barangaroo. And while I am a co-founder of this amazing organization and had the great fortune to see it grow over the last five years, I would say a majority of everyone in this room has no clue who I am because my career has nothing to do with sports. <laughs> um, my day job is to reimagine cities. So I've, I'm kind of an urbanologist and my first love affair is with cities. Um, and I get to pinch myself because I get to think about this stuff all the time. And I think I've been waiting for the last five years when the this movement of green sports and how it can impact and change the way we look at cities beyond the stadium footprint um, and reimagine those cities, uh, I'm really excited. I think I'm the most, per most excited person in this room for this next panel, which is focusing on how sports can re revitalize our cities. So without further ado, I want to invite our panelists up for the opening plenary, Beyond the Building, How Sports Facilities Contribute to Sustainable Communities and Urban Vitalization. Please come up to the stage. And I'm also really pleased to introduce our moderator and friend, Chris DeVolder, Sustainable Design Leader for Sports and Recreation at HOK. Chris is the Sustainable Design Leader at HOK's Sports Recreation and Entertainment Practice. He's known for his thought leadership in the green sports movement. He is currently the Sustainable Project Director for the new Atlantic, Atlanta Stadium and the Project Leader for the sports-related component of Notre Dame's $400 million campus Crossroads Project. Um, he's also a good friend, and I've gotten to know him through a mutual colleague of ours, um, Jason McClendon, the founder of the Living Building Challenge. And I can also attest that he's a wicked drummer, and he used to play in a band with Jason in Kansas City called Thistle. Come on up, buddy. <laughs> I guess that's, that's fitting. Neil, Neil Peart is the professor on the drum set. So, Beth, thank you for all your words and all the work you guys are doing. I think it's fitting that sh what she talked about is really going to tie into this panel as well as the next panel on food. And to give a little context on what we're going to talk about, I want to tell maybe what's a, a, a cautionary tale. As a brash young architect with a little bit more hair in 1993, had the opportunity, very first project out of school, to work on the renovation of a middle school in Lawrence, Kansas. And because we were brash and young, we knew what we were doing. We didn't, we didn't need any help. We didn't need to talk to the stakeholders. Well, the result of that was a skewed intention. We like to talk about what is the result of our intention. This was opening day. We missed the demographics. They had to put these temporary trailers up for the kids. And what that made me understand is the lines we draw on paper affect the lives of the users. And not just the users of the buildings, but their parents, their family, their neighborhood. So fast forward 20 years, we look at the University of Washington Husky Stadium, where the lines on the paper affect the lives of the user the users, the stakeholders, the students, in a positive way. Hopefully it looks a little bit better than that last slide. So we want to think about that today as we're going through this process. So we're going to bring up our distinguished panelists. And it's a real pleasure for me getting to know some of these folks for the first time and, and some of them who I call friends to, to have them come up. So first, Canal Merchant, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the Sacramento Kings. In this capacity, Canal oversees a portfolio of top strategic, political, and community initiatives for the Kings with a special focus on advancing progress on the new downtown entertainment and sports complex scheduled to open in the fall of 16. And we are, please welcome Canal. So we had the music as I walked up. We weren't able to get walk-up music for everybody. But, you know, sports covers all parts of our culture, as does music. And as we were talking, getting ready for this, we always like to ask the question, okay, you're opening your, your facility. You get to pick the band. Who do you pick? 
can all pick Jay-Z and Beyonce. I hope we can get me a ticket on that. Next panelist is John Marler, Senior Director of Energy and Environment, AEG. In this role, John oversees AEG's Corporate Environmental Sustainability Program, AEG One Earth, and AEG Energy Services, which is AEG's Corporate Energy Management Program. Through both, they identify goals to guide company decision-making measures and quantifies the environmental impact of its operations and develops tools to improve its environmental performance. John? Welcome. All right. So John threw the question back at me. Well, we operate a lot of different facilities. It depends where it is. He's trying to make it difficult, but you too was his who I think is still in town, maybe. Anyone see Bono the last couple of days? Third, Christine Fowler, Associate Athletic Director for Compliance at Indiana University. She's currently in that role, joining the office in September 2012. In her current position, she oversees all IU compliance operations, in addition to serving on the department's senior staff, coordinating all sustainability initiatives within the athletic department, and acting as the sport administrator for men's and women's golf and women's field hockey. She does not have much going on. So come on up, Chris. It won't be a surprise that being from IU, she picked John Cougar Mellencamp. Next, uh, a, a good friend and lucky to call him a client, Bob Black, Executive Vice President, Edmonton Arena Corporation, Kate's Group, and, as of yesterday, Chief Project Development Officer, Oilers Entertainment Group. <laughs> Bob is the Executive Vice President of Rexall Sports and Entertainment for the Keats Group, as well as Executive Vice President for Edmonton Arena Corporation, where he's heading up the design and development of Rogers Place. He was a member of the negotiating committee that put in place the master agreement with the City of Edmonton and the numerous ancillary agreements thereto, and a huge Rolling Stones fan. Thanks, Bob. And finally, a good friend, Greg Beatles, Executive Vice President, Chief Administrative Officer, and Chief Financial Officer, is that all? For the Atlanta Falcons, AMB Sports and Entertainment Group. 2014 season marks Greg's 20 years of dedicated service with the Falcons. In December 2013, he was named Executive Vice President, Chief Administrative and Financial Officer. He continues to manage the Atlanta Falcons Football Club, Atlanta Falcons Stadium Company, and the new Atlanta United FC Major League Soccer franchise set to begin in 2017. Another U2 fan. Welcome, Greg. So because we're all in design and construction, we want to make this a very visual panel and presentation. There will be cards being passed around. Hopefully you all give us some good questions that we'll get to here in a little bit. But first we want to start with you, Greg. Give the folks a little background about the project. Sure. Uh, so this is an image of uh, our new stadium. We are a year into construction already, a little bit more than a year. Uh, we've got about two years to go. Um, the project goes back, uh, as you guys know, that have done uh, major facility projects seven or eight years ago, so it's going to be about a 10-year project for those of us that started at the beginning. Um, but it's, it's really going to be incredible. Uh, our owner, Arthur Blank, uh, decided from early on that as we were going through negotiations with the state and city on a new facility that he wanted to be downtown. Uh, so this is basically just next door to the Georgia Dome, where the Falcons play now. Uh, and uh, we uh, agreed with the state and city leaders that it was also going to be a multi-purpose facility. So uh, in addition to our teams, uh, MLS and NFL, uh, the 30 uh, games and matches that we'll have there, there's also another 20 or so uh, what we call legacy events. So things that are going on at the Georgia Dome now, uh, that they've done a great job on over the years that will continue into this new building along with uh, great concerts, uh, Chick-fil-A uh, kickoff games, Chick-fil-A Bowl. Uh, we uh, were close to uh, announcing an extended agreement with uh, the SEC for their football championship. 
so just a lot of great things for the community right in downtown Atlanta, uh, which uh, downtown has, has uh, really uh, seen a vitalization lately and just a lot of great things going on downtown, so we're excited to be uh, a part of that. There's a lot of great firsts. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Chris uh, and the team at uh, 316 HOK uh, have helped us work through on this. The, this is a retractable roof stadium. You can see a little bit of that at the top here. But it's an eight-piece uh, roof that opens up. It looks a lot like a camera, camera eye aperture when it opens up, uh, which is going to be really neat. And uh, we also have a 360-degree uh, halo video board uh, that's uh, 58 feet tall and 1,100 feet around. Uh, so um, it will be the largest video display anywhere when it opens up, really, to experience sports and other events in the round. Uh, so that's the uh, maybe a little bit more than elevator pitch on the, on the billion and a half dollar project that we've got going on in Atlanta. Great. Thanks, Greg. So next, Bob, we're moving to you, Rogers Place, downtown Edmonton. So Rogers Place uh, is uh, under construction right now. Uh, our journey with Rogers Place goes back to 2008. Uh, we ba began construction in March of last year, and we will open in September of 2016. Uh, in addition to being a great piece of architecture, uh, also designed by uh, HOK, uh, Rogers Place will be uh, a LEED Silver certified uh, facility. And from the beginning, Rogers Place was intended, uh, both by us and by our partner, uh, the City of Edmonton, to become critical mass for a broader uh, private sector revitalization of our downtown core. Edmonton's downtown has suffered from decades of underinvestment. When we started this project, some 30% of our downtown was surface parking, and another 20% had uh, structures of uh, two stories or less. Uh, the Edmonton Arena District, which will take uh, form around Rogers Place, will be a very dense, compact, sustainable, uh, and connected district. In the first phase uh, of that district, we are uh, at the Cates Group investing $1.7 billion in mixed use development, uh, 1.3 million, 1.3 billion square, uh, sorry, 1.3 million square feet of office space, uh, 215,000 square feet of retail, 1,000-plus uh, residential units, all connected uh, to uh, a transportation system uh, around it uh, that has seven light rail transit uh, stations within a 10-minute walk. Uh, this will see an unprecedented level of construction activity in our downtown core uh, that is uh, going to uh, fundamentally change uh, the face of our city. We uh, are funding uh, the municipal commitment uh, to uh, the construction cost of Rogers Place through uh, community revitalization levy, which is uh, the Canadian equivalent of a tax incremental finance, where you take the uplift from uh, new uh, construction, the municipal tax uplift, and you invest it in infrastructure. Uh, the uh, CRL in uh, Edmonton is going to not only pay for the city's investment in uh, Rogers Place uh, in full with interest, but it's also going to fund $385 million of new uh, initiatives in our downtown core, a $90 million project which will make our streets more green and walkable, uh, a new downtown park, uh, a twinning of our uh, utility uh, backbone in the downtown core to separate storm and sanitary, uh, new vision for our historical major promenade, Jasper Avenue, all being funded by the uplift in municipal taxes that is coming from uh, this uh, development. Uh, we've got 25 cranes in the sky in downtown Edmonton right now, and there'll be 31 by the end of summer. We went through uh, the 1990s, a uh, whole decade, where we may have, may have had five cranes in the sky. So we've got an unprecedented level of construction activity in downtown Edmonton that has been spurred by this arena. Uh, we are experiencing halcyon days in Edmonton. It's very exciting. Great. Thanks, Bob. So as we were putting this panel together, we felt like we didn't want to just talk about stadiums. Certainly what we're talking about is going beyond the four walls and the roof. Uh, but that also plays very well with what athletic departments are doing. So, Chris, we'd like you to talk a little bit about some of the programs you are working on that expand beyond just athletics. 
Thank you, Chris, and thank you to the Green Sports Alliance. If you were all wondering which one of these is not like the others, that's definitely um, when it got to me on the panel. As you can see, just to give you a little bit of background, Indiana University is located in Bloomington, Indiana, and that's a town of 80,000 people. Our campus is approximately 42,000 um, students, so it's, it's a quintessential college town as we often talk to. Um, recruits and other folks around our program and so some of you may hearken back to your college days and that nice crisp fall Saturday um, and heading over to the football stadium and that's really where a uh, majority of our efforts have been focused for the past five football seasons at IU we have focused on um, our recycling efforts within our tailgating areas and and you may hearken back to those memories and you may not have made it into the stadium at some point in time on a Saturday and just stayed at the tailgate. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. You were still cheering loudly, most likely. But um, that's really where we've been. And so we've been poised and ready as we launch into this upcoming season to really go inside our stadium. And, and we'll be focusing all of our efforts on a zero waste stadium. And, and this is uh, uh, obviously uncharted waters for us. Um, but uh, at the same time, it's very exciting. And so to kind of bring that full circle for us, just like uh, Disney has their environmentality, we also have um, tenants that we have as our core values within the athletic department. And uh, we call it 24 Sports, One Team. It's the spirit of Indiana. And we live it and we breathe it. It's all over our buildings. It's on T-shirts that we wear. Our student athletes talk about it. And down when we get to the eighth tenant, it's we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. And that's pretty profound. And you can take that in a lot of different directions. And, and where we pull it full circle in terms of our sustainability efforts within the athletic department. And I should mention, I've only been a part of our athletic department for a little bit over two years. And so this is new to my plate. I'm new to the university. But I took it and I ran with it, right? Because that's what we do with catchphrases. We're taking it and we run with it. Um, we are a part of something bigger than ourselves, and that's our messaging that we do with Green and Cream and Crimson. We want folks not just to come to our football game on a Saturday, we want them to come to any athletic event on our campus. So we've got seven different buildings that they could come into, and we want them to know how to act once they come onto our campus and they're a fan within our program. And that's really where our, our mission is, our green and cream and crimson. We focus on football games because that's the biggest impact we can have. But essentially, when they come onto our athletics campus, a fan does, or a visitor, we want them to know what IU Athletics is all about and that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. Thank you. Yeah. Kunal, two years ago, not even two years ago, there was a, a very real possibility that the Kings were leaving. The city rallied around the team and the mayor, and this is the result of it. There we go. Yeah, so, so thanks for bringing back all those repressed memories, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a real honor for the Sacramento Kings uh, to be a part of the Green Sports Alliance, and particularly this panel, because it is hard to overstate the connection between the Sacramento Kings and the people of Sacramento. Uh, that's been true for the entire 30-plus years that we've been lucky enough to have a professional sports team. And it is the only professional sports team in Sacramento, which I think heightens that, uh, that love affair between the fans uh, in the community and the team. And as Chris pointed to, we really had that allegiance tested not once but twice over the last couple of years, uh, where uh, the former ownership of the team was very interested in moving to Southern California and Seattle, which are both wonderful markets. But the Kings belong in Sacramento, and our mayor, who is a former professional NBA player, Kevin Johnson, uh, really led an extraordinary effort that brought together and galvanized our entire community, both basketball fans and just fans of Sacramento, to fight and uh, ultimately prevail in, in keeping this team. And at the fulcrum of that fight was the, the need to build a new arena. Chris, when you put up that photo in the beginning, I, I almost confused that for Arco Arena, or Sleep Train Arena, where we play right now, which frankly has about the same architectural character and isn't much bigger. It's, it's an old facility, it's a beloved facility, but it's an outdated facility. And for both the team's purposes as well as the city's, we needed to build a new facility. So I, I chose this picture. Um, uh, 
almost to sort of showcase the other part of the story. You can see in the, you know, the bottom right corner the arena itself, and there's better images of it, and it's an extraordinary structure in and of itself. But we fought very hard both as a team and as a community to, to anchor this project in downtown. And it sounds very similar to what um, Edmonton is going through. This was an extraordinarily blighted part of our downtown. I think there were maybe seven residents uh, when they did a, seven, a census tract a couple years ago who actually lived there. And now you're going to see this unbelievable economic revitalization that is spurred on by this arena. The, the arena itself is a $477 million project uh, with significant public investment. Um, but it anchors a billion dollar uh, economic redevelopment project that the Kings are doing, which is what you see here, here with the hotel and retail and office. And then beyond that, you have 238 acres of additional development of, of all the sort of different types of mixed use uh, that's going to happen over the next few years and generate uh, $11.5 billion in, in economic activity over the next 35 years. And so when we think about our facility, we've literally structured it to be open. Uh, and we can get into that later. It's an indoor-outdoor facility, which is relatively unorthodox for a basketball arena. Um, but it's very much an arena that's bigger than basketball, that's very much in the context of the broader community and not just our facility for our team. Great, Kanal. Thank you very much. John, we're seeing a lot of these projects moving back to downtown or staying downtown. Talk a little bit about what AEG has seen over the years and what you guys see in the future. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, really wanted to show here is that uh, with these projects, uh, they really kind of evolve over a very long time frame. Uh, on the left, you see a picture of uh, South Park, downtown Los Angeles in the 1970s. Uh, the middle shot is uh, the current state of uh, the LA Live campus and surrounding areas. You know, it started with the construction of Staples Center in 1999, and it's evolved uh, to add the LA Live office complex, uh, the Microsoft Theater, the JW Marriott, and this Carlton Hotel. And then we move forward to the 2020s to show all of the additional uh, building that's going to take place, not only within the confines of uh, LA Live, but also in the surrounding area. You know, Bob talked about the number of cranes in downtown uh, Edmonton. Uh, I don't know if we have 30 in downtown LA, but it seems like it. Uh, this effort has really spurred just a phenomenal uh, resurgence and, and reflowering of the downtown Los Angeles area. Uh, anything from condos to new office space to new retail. Uh, so I kind of use it uh, from our perspective as our uh, original concept and, and proof of concept. Uh, and then kind of wanted to use that as a base to talk about three other projects that we have in the works around the world uh, in reverse chronological order. The next one would be the O2 uh, complex in London on the Greenwich Peninsula. Uh, I don't have any photos of that, but basically it's the same concept. We came in, uh, opened the arena in 2005, and since then it's spurred uh, redevelopment of that whole area from transit to office space, new luxury hotels. There's uh, 16,000 residential units that will be going up uh, by 2017, I believe. Uh, and then moving to Berlin, again, the same concept. Uh, we built the O2 World Berlin Arena uh, in East Berlin. Uh, it's going to be rebranded now as the Mercedes-Benz Arena, uh, but we're in the process of breaking ground on a new entertainment district there in East Berlin, which will kind of follow the same model uh, of LA Live. Uh, and then finally, moving to Las Vegas, uh, we uh, just put the finishing touches uh, on the top of the new Las Vegas arena, uh, right there on the strip, uh, kind of next to the New York, New York uh, casino and hotel property. Uh, very excited about that project. It's going to open up uh, spring of next year, Lead Gold certified. Uh, and then with our partners, MGM, it will have a new entertainment district that will improve access and enjoyability of the whole strip area. So, uh, you know, I think this is a great model. Uh, very excited to see what's going on in the other cities. And, and I think it just really shows what can happen. But I would just emphasize the point that uh, you really have to take the long view and, and let these things uh, develop organically, not only within the confines of the district, but also in the city. Great. Thank you, John. So as, as we've talked about, the, all of your projects, your programs, are really going outside of just the four walls and the roof. It's got to be quite a process when you, you think about engaging stakeholders, whether it's within your own organizations or outside your organizations. I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about 
how that's helped, maybe it's been a challenge, and how you've overcome that. John, I'll start with you this time. Sure. Uh, you know, I think from our perspective, it's always been part of the process. You know, I think you see that with the, the listing of the uh, four projects. And, uh, you know, it's definitely not without its uh, challenges, uh, mostly just, I think, in terms of the time and the complexity of bringing all the stakeholders together, uh, getting consensus on what the project looks like, what the parameters are. Uh, but I think if you, if you commit to it, uh, it's going to result in a much better uh, project, and it's going to have these uh, extended synergistic effects in the community, which is only going to help the long-term success of the project. Yeah, so democracy is alive and well in Sacramento. It's a, it's a government town, uh, at least it historically has been. It's the state capital of California, and just a couple blocks away from the arena is the state capital. Uh, and the largest employer in our community is state government. So we have a, a base of constituents with a very high IQ when it comes to how government works. Now, historically, uh, I would there's tons and tons of strengths. I don't want to get in trouble with the state of California uh, uh, of being in a government town. But what our community is, I think, unfortunately, over the years prior to this project, we didn't really get it, is understanding how to, and, and to debate things to the point where the private development walks away or the project dies. We're very good at identifying uh, the problem is less good at identifying the solution. And this project has been, in my opinion, kind of an evolution of that thinking in a really positive way. Uh, this project enjoys more unity and um, civic pride than anything I've ever seen in Sacramento, which is amazing considering that eight or nine years ago there was a ballot initiative to fund a new arena that squeaked by to a loss by a margin of 20% yes, 80% no. So that's how unpopular the idea of public financing for new building was not that many years ago. And, and, and through a process that you know, I led with the mayor and the team and others, both in the public and private sector, we, we've, we've shifted the needle up to about 66 to 70 percent positive. There's always going to be a third, roughly speaking, of people who, no matter what you do, are just not going to be on board. But there's a middle. And, uh, you know, what, what folks will probably say here is absolutely right. Engagement is absolutely worth it. Um, you have to do it in a, in a sincere way. You have to start early. And what we did is we knew that this was such a high-profile issue by virtue of the team wanting to move that we just made sure at every step of the way there was always an effort to engage the public via the media, via town halls, via social media, which is an incredibly new platform. It's frustrating sometimes. It's time-consuming sometimes. But what you do is you start to create a culture of kind of shared opportunity, but also shared accountability, where the people who are identifying problems are then challenged to come up with solutions. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they maybe back away because that's, that's not their forte. But you, you create the critical mass of energy to move things forward. And I think we have a lot more constructive culture moving forward in Sacramento as a result. I'll, I'll chime in next. And, and I think... I don't know if my co-presenters would agree, but particularly in college athletics, things happen fast, and most times we wanted to, them to happen yesterday. We roughly, you know, we'll have seven days turnaround for, for a football game, or two days turnaround, or a 24-hour turnaround for an arena. Um, and so when we drill down to the university scope of things, uh, there's a lot of constituents that have to be around the table. And, and, and it's um, maybe a little bit different than when you're dealing with your public politics. You've got that to navigate. But um, our project moving forward in, in really a short period of time has brought a lot of people around the table in, in, a, very, in a very exciting way, that they're all very supportive um, and excited about the direction. Athletics, we kind of consider our um, own little... Uh, microcosm within within the university setting and that we are can test things out in our arena that can then bleed out to our whole university campus and so that's right now where our counterparts are very excited about that like let's see how this works for seven home football games where you know the masses will come and then how can we create the infrastructure to then do that on our whole campus of 42,000 um, and so it, it's been a welcome conversation. Uh, and it's just sometimes difficult to get everybody around the table at the time frame that you want them to make things happen. Um, as we know, events don't happen. Buildings just don't go up. Um, we're not talking about football games at the end uh, or in, in September a month beforehand. We're talking about them 
12 months in advance because of the planning that goes into those events. But it's been very well received and it's, and it's exciting to see where the support is going on our campus to be able to then spread that out and impact our whole campus community and then hopefully our um, Bloomington community as well. It's interesting to hear uh, your discussion about uh, Sacramento. Uh, in Edmonton, the negotiations around the public-private partnership uh, re with respect to the funding of the arena were difficult, complex negotiations. At times, they were acrimonious. Uh, but what held us together was the mutual belief that, done well, the arena could lead to uh, a revitalization of our downtown core. And, and what that has given rise to is, is what has become a very functional, uh, very coherent partnership between uh, the city of Edmonton and uh, the uh, Cates Group. Uh, and we've worked a lot together on stakeholder consultation. And it's been quite an interesting journey. I remember when we set out on it, uh, I spoke with a developer friend of mine, and he said, you're going to hate this. Uh, you know, the consultation is, is, is tedious. It'll take way longer than you ever uh, would expect. You're going to hear a lot of things that uh, you ultimately won't be interested in. Uh, what I actually found was quite a lot different than that because the public consultation in our project undeniably improved our project outcomes. We were challenged. Uh, we were challenged to make sure that we did things right. In fact, we recognized that we only had one chance to get things right. We have 26 acres of, uh, of prime real estate in downtown Edmonton. That creates a lot of opportunity, but it also creates a high level of responsibility to get things right. And I remember sitting in, uh, in the 360 offices, now HOK in, uh, in Kansas City, uh, looking at a master planning exercise and recognizing that if we were really going to connect our district and make sure that it connected to the warehouse district where our primary residential core is and it connected to the financial and the commercial cores, uh, and indeed it connected to uh, the North Edge Residential and the Civic Precinct, that we had to buy another piece of real estate. And uh, it was an expensive piece of real estate because everybody knew who we were uh, and why we were buying it. And the owners exacted a, a, a heavy price in that purchase. But as we sat in the Kansas City offices, uh, the light came on in my mind that in order to get this thing right, uh, we had to buy it. Uh, and what that led to is, a crea is a, the creation of an opportunity to really connect a great pedestrian network in our downtown, to make our downtown less reliant on, uh, on vehicles, uh, to really create a, an opportunity to, uh, it, to enhance uh, the neighborhoods within our downtown and, and make them more attractive for residents, make them more attractive uh, for corporate head offices, uh, make them more attractive uh, for tourists. Uh, and so stakeholder consultation at Edmonton absolutely improved the outcomes. Great. And there's rumor floating around that there may be, in addition to your pedestrian ways and your bike ways, that there might be an ice skating path to yes. the arena. Is that true? Yes. Edmonton is, uh, is, uh, is uh, just a, a buzz right now with, uh, with uh, young uh, entrepreneurial minds. And... Uh, We've got uh, one young fellow who is advocating uh, that we actually connect our downtown uh, through uh, an iceway, uh, where uh, residents in Edmonton put, put on their skates and, uh, and skate to work, uh, uh, skate to the hockey games. Uh, and it's a very, very cool idea that's got, got some legs. Great. Greg. Uh, our, our project, uh, as well, is a public-private partnership, so there was a lot of public discourse around it and, and continues to be. Um, in the community that the stadium is immediately in, uh, to the west, there are a couple of neighborhoods there that uh, have been very troubled for decades. And uh, rather than uh, announcing our project sort of as the fix to the area around there, we've tried to see it as, as really a catalyst uh, to bring the business community together, those stakeholders, uh, the philanthropic community together, uh, and work together uh, on an area that's probably had dozens of plans on how to, quote, fix the problems over there. Uh, but instead, we've seen uh, just a lot of groups coming together uh, to work 
uh, around the stadium. We've seen a lot of investment starting to, to come in the communities are, uh, around there. Uh, so that's been exciting to get all the different stakeholders involved in the project and the surrounding area. That's a good point. Have you all seen in your, your processes that you've had maybe existing partners that have really stepped up because of the sustainability initiatives and or new partners that have come to the table because of what you're doing? I'll open that up for anybody. Yeah, I'll start. We've certainly seen that as we just started the conversations on zero waste. Um, we've seen partners uh, become more excited from our on-campus uh, facilities uh, and also the community. Um, we have a city sustainability um, um, coordinator within the city of Bloomington and they've come to our side and, and want to be engaging and helpful as we venture out into this new initiative for this upcoming football season. Yeah, and in terms of, in terms of Sacramento, I think one of the exciting partnerships that we look forward to is on our, our food and beverage, our concessions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we sit in, in Sacramento in the middle of this incredible uh, agricultural breadbasket uh, in California. Everyone here at some point in the week is going to eat uh, or drink something that was sourced uh, from California. And so as we thought, thought about concessions, which is an enormous frontier for all of us in terms of thinking about green, uh, we thought local sourcing is something where we could make a really powerful statement. And so 90% of all the food and beverage that's going to be at our facility is going to come from a local source within 90 miles. Not every area of the country can pull that off. We can do that. We may need to borrow some of your water if you're cool with that. <laughs> but other than that, um, that's a really ambitious goal, but we're proud of it. And what was exciting is that idea was always kind of uh, you know, fomenting in our heads, but when we did our whole process of trying to select our concessions partners, multiple folks came forward and intuitively understood that sustainability and local sourcing would be something that we'd want to differentiate on. And our ultimate partner is Legends, who, who partnered with four of the top chefs in Sacramento to put together this sort of super group proposal that was very tough for us to say no to just because they got it. And so that's a really powerful example for us of a competitive advantage that we'll use uh, both in terms of our marketing and our revenue, but also is really grounded in sustainability and doing the right thing. Our partnership with the yeah, with the city of Edmonton uh, just continues to blossom and 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 extend into into all sorts of new uh, areas and opportunities. And uh, the city of Edmonton is a, is a world leader in waste management, and uh, that has been something that we've really been able to uh, to lever off. Uh, 93% of our construction uh, waste is, uh, has uh, been recycled uh, year to date. Uh, we will do some really great things, I'm sure, with the City of Edmonton in, in terms of, uh, of uh, waste from the facility. And it really, what it has led to is, is it's led to uh, just an ongoing dialogue where, where there's a constant uh, exchange of ideas and, and identification of opportunities. And, and I think that that's going to be a real strength of the partnership going forward. Um, we are uh, we're targeting lead platinum for new construction with our project. I think I can say that Scott leaked it out the other day. Um, so that's what we're shooting for, and that you know everything behind that those, those goals. A number of our uh, corporate sponsors that we have. Uh, have really uh, jumped on, on this project with us and increased their investment to allow us uh, to help us get to that, that target and then also, of course, uh, forward how we operate the building. So um, those, those kind of big uh, goals that we have and what we want to do around sustainability uh, have taken a number of the partners that we've had for a long time and uh, really uh, given them a platform to increase their investment in the project and what we're doing. Great. We've got some really good questions. I'm, I'm going to combine a couple of them. So the, the first one, I guess, is, is for Bob and Kunal. You guys are not downtown currently. Probably would have been really easy to stay out in the suburbs. So why downtown? Well, from our perspective, I think that uh, that really begins with, uh, with our owner and chair, Daryl Cates. Uh, Daryl uh, is an Edmontonian, and uh, he's also an Edmontonian that uh, has had the good fortune of being able to travel and see other great cities. And, and I think that he recognized right from the very beginning that uh, purchasing the orders uh, could be a path to uh, not only 
uh, owning his beloved hockey team, but uh, that it could uh, create the opportunity for him to help build this facility downtown and help drive the revitalization of downtown. Uh, in Edmonton's downtown uh, just has not been competitive. Uh, and, of course, we compete every day for uh, the best and brightest people and, uh, and, and corporate investment, and, uh, and uh, we've just not fared well uh, in that process. And so uh, the key uh, from uh, our perspective from the very beginning was to, to use that arena as critical mass to drive uh, private sector revitalization of the downtown. And, and, and happily, we're seeing a $5 billion uh, byproduct of that right now. Yeah, I think very similarly with Sacramento, it's a public-private partnership to, to finance this facility. And it, it, the way that the deal was designed is that it, it's in the best interest of both the public and the private sectors to be downtown. From the public perspective, again, I spoke a minute ago, and uh, uh, as with Edmonton, this is a blighted area of downtown. It's really the front porch of the city. If you come off the highway into Sacramento, the first thing you see of our city is this very, you know, barren, 28 days later, like, post-apocalyptic hellscape right now. Um, <laughs> we're, I'm not on the marketing team. So we're, uh, but we're changing that. And this arena is going to anchor that, and it's already happening for all the reasons we said. So from a public policy point of view, the city, the county, the state had poured, I think, upwards of $400 million over 30 or 40 years to try to revitalize this area, and it didn't work. You know, this, is a, this was an area that coincided with a tremendous suburbanization of California, and particularly Sacramento. And what urban planning folks took a minute to get is nobody's going to drive by a gap to get to a gap. And so they kept trying to put all these retail experiences in the downtown core that people could get much more easily in the suburbs. And what was needed for Sacramento is something different. There had to be something unique why somebody who's comfortably living out in the suburbs would schlep all the way into the city uh, and come. And, and an arena and these sports facilities that we all work on are those type of major, unique, regional attractors. And so historically in Sacramento, those for political and other reasons, whether they be arts complexes or theaters or things like that, would always migrate to the burbs. It was critical for Sacramento that this arena come into the core, really repopulate that downtown from a public policy point of view. And then on the, on the development side, uh, our ownership group paid a pretty penny to buy this team. And the facility itself has a, still has a significant p private investment, both in terms of the arena and the ancillary development. And the way the city set up the deal is to really incentivize us as a team to really spend a lot of money to build up the downtown core. And the density that we'll get in a downtown location vis-a-vis -vis the suburbs is so much better in terms of the economic return to us, in terms of capturing all the activity of consumers before they come into the facility and after, that it was a no-brainer. Right now we're out in the suburbs. We're this sort of small arena in this ocean of you know, asphalt where there's 12,000 parking spots situated right next to two major interstates. So you can imagine how easy it is for somebody to drive off the highway, roll into the game, drive out. If they're me, they get lost in that ocean of parking, finding their car, but they eventually find it. And they don't go down to the bistro, they don't go to the theater, they get back on the highway and they go home. So all that economic activity is lost. That's not going to happen in a downtown location. And Greg, you guys are a little bit on the opposite. Your, your friends down the road have decided to leave the downtown core. Some may say they're escaping to traffic hell, northern Atlanta. Uh, what was behind the decision to stay where you guys are? I think, uh, like Bob, a lot of it came from the top. Our owner, Chairman Arthur Blank, is a downtown Atlanta guy, uh, founded Home Depot there. 30-some-odd uh, years ago, and uh, his foundation has, has made a lot of investment in the area already. So he really challenged us when we were looking at the different options uh, to try first to be downtown. Uh, he believes in the future of Atlanta and, and has seen it uh, change over the last few decades. Um, so it was, um, you know, intentional, certainly, to try to be down there. Uh, it's, it's a very tight site that we have. Uh, it's a very expensive site that we have. We'd love to have, uh, you know, we're in the south. College football tailgating is huge. We'd love to have a lot of uh, big parking spaces where, where we could tailgate. We're trying to create some special fan experiences around that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're investing, you know, additional dollars to be able to be down there and be a part of uh, downtown Atlanta and how it's, how it's really booming right now. 
So John, something you and I have briefly touched on, and Jason Twill and I talk about this a lot, is this idea of developing a district. The project these guys have been talking about is, is really starting to create the district. And as, as we look ahead, what is it that you guys look at as you're developing projects around the world related to this idea of not a, a building scale, but a district scale? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it has a lot to do with the other projects that we've talked about here is, uh, you know, you have to start uh, with good raw materials. And in a lot of cases, those are neglected parts of the city uh, that have good access. I mean, LA Live uh, is uh, a couple of blocks from a major uh, uh, metro station. There's another one just to the east of the site. It's at the intersection of uh, two major uh, highways. Same thing with the, uh, the O2 complex in, in Berlin. Obviously, being next to the Strip is going to benefit the uh, Las Vegas arena. Uh, but, you know, it, it's also taking the long view, uh, taking some of these factors into account, you know, trends where I, I think people uh, are, are kind of reversing the flow a little bit in terms of suburbanization. People like this atmosphere, more of an urban feel. You don't, you're not so car dependent. Uh, you can have a lot of uh, experiences from dining to retail to entertainment in one place that's walkable. And, uh, yeah, I, I think you just have to find that, that location and, and look down the road. And as I showed on my slide, it's decades down the road. It's not just a few years. Uh, and, and see how the project can kind of organically grow. And then things can move to the project as well. So there's a, another question we have from the audience about how do you guys avoid gentrification of these sort of projects, which can result as a consequence of revitalization, slash, how can we ensure that because of these projects, the economic sustainability of the local communities can maintain well after these projects are built? So if I could just jump in on this one. Uh, you know, part of the stakeholder process that we talked about, uh, that we've been involved with at, at all these sites, uh, you know, that's a, a very core issue. Uh, the job creation, uh, and then the impact on housing. And so when we engage with the stakeholders and we make commitments to the community, those always include uh, setting aside a certain number of uh, affordable housing, uh, making sure that there are long-term job prospects. Uh, and again, all those things, I think, kind of build on themselves. You know, if, if you're creating uh, good jobs, you're enabling people to afford housing. Uh, and, you know, as the city grows around the project, these things just kind of build on themselves. But, you know, it's something that you have to take into account from the very beginning, you know, not just as part of the, the stakeholder process, but to ensure the long-term success of the project. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in Sacramento we're in an interesting position in this particular area. As I said earlier, it was a pretty empty area. And so unlike maybe some facilities that are built in areas where neighborhoods are getting displaced or you are seeing some of the, the effects of gentrification. I don't even know what the word is. What is it called when you go from gentrifying from a non-human species to human species? Because that's what's happening downtown right now. We're, we're actually getting people there as opposed to just tumbleweeds and, and, and lower levels of the food chain. So that's exciting. So right now, we're just trying to get anybody downtown, and you're going to get people from up and down the economic spectrum. What we actually need in Sacramento right now is market rate housing. What happened with the downturn is uh, we have a lot of you know, government planned affordable housing projects that were built out, but the mix is a little off because we had that real estate crash, prices got depressed, and there were instances where affordable housing prices were actually higher than the market at the time. Now that's, again, changing. Our, our arena is going to be a big part of that, um, but it is a concern probably not in the first five or six years. Uh, it's going to be more six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Once we realize the initial vision, when those pretty pictures become reality, you are going to see, um, you know, higher income individuals wanting to move in there, as you've seen elsewhere, and then that's when maybe the, the impact is going to spread into neighborhoods where you have uh, more of affordable rate housing. Our mayor is already on top of it, to his credit. He's already working on a plan to build 10,000 new housing units in the downtown core, but make sure that there's a blend. So yes, we need that market rate housing right now just to lift up the entire area, but building into that is an accommodation for our homeless population and for our affordable rate hot population. And I don't think there's a science to it. This is a very complicated issue, and you're constantly, you know, public privately trying to turn the knobs. Um, and it's, it's not easy. But the best we can do right now in Sacramento is just try to get anybody down there, create the density, create the energy, and then have policymakers who are holding us accountable um, for making sure that everyone can benefit. Great. A couple last questions before we wrap up. So these projects, 
you know, the haters will come out and say, oh, why are you doing this? It's not really going to do anything. We can do development without this. So just quickly going down the line, if your project wasn't there, would the surrounding development revitalization happen? Yes or no? No. Nope. Uh, no. Uh, our project is on uh, rail lands uh, that uh, I came down uh, town uh, beginning in uh, mid-'80s, and uh, there's never been any development uh, on those lands, some of which are brown. Uh, and so uh, we're now seeing uh, projects that have just kicked off uh, in just a, just a absolute uh, uh, coincidence with the uh, construction of the arena. There's no doubt in Edmonton that it's been driven by the arena. I think our, our project I mentioned before has really been a catalyst to jumpstart uh, investment down in the area the west side of Atlanta. There's always been a lot of discussion. There's been a few things here or there, uh, but our project and all the investment we're making and all the attention that the area is getting, I think, has certainly helped it uh, to grow and speed up and sort of ignite it. And, uh, so I would say it's certainly happening faster than it would have otherwise without our project. Great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time. The five people in front of you here are really, I'd say they're pioneers. They're getting us back to urban development, and they're raising the bar, which is what we need to be doing. We talk about great ideas at the Alliance and at the Summit. These folks are looking forward. Let's give them a round of applause.